Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm your host, Jakari Jackson. It is April 22nd, 2015, and here's a look at our top stories. Tonight, third wave feminism continues to sweep the country and has even poisoned the U.S. military as U.S. Army cadets are forced to wear high heels. Hmm, I wonder what ISIS or the Russian military thinks about that. Can't be good. Plus, the man who was viciously beaten by cops after a chase on horseback receives a $650,000 settlement. And the VA is caught sending veterans private medical information to the FBI. All that plus much more up next on the InfoWars Nightly News. Over the past year, we've had countless examples of police brutality. And while these things continue to happen, there's finally actually something being done about this. We see officers fired, suspended, and sometimes even settlements for those people who are victimized. As is the case that happened recently, a man stole a horse, which was a capital offense back in the day. So I can't give the guy uh, too much slack on that. But this is Francis Jared Husak. He fled with a horse, a stolen horse, and was then, I guess you'd say, attacked by some deputies out in the woods. Now the man did give up. He didn't want to uh, further agitate the officers. The officers tased the man and beat the man pretty much to a bloody pulp. But the gentleman is receiving a $650,000 settlement. And while I am glad that he is receiving a settlement, I am also, I wish it wouldn't have happened in the first place, I guess is the best way to say that. Because this comes out of the pocket of the taxpayer. So if you live in this man's county, you are footing the bill for this. It's not coming out of the police department or other areas. It's coming out of the local taxpayer. And as I was saying earlier, I wish these incidents would not happen. Once again, this guy was stealing a horse, which was a capital offense years back. But we need to find some way, a happy medium, to get rid of these things. Because whether it's Eric Gardner or uh, an, any number of these guys, there's so many. Kelly Thomas, another guy as well. At least when we get these guys on camera now, something is actually happening. Because we heard all the talk and all the rhetoric talking about how we need to put body cameras on these officers. They're rejecting the notion here in the city of Austin, Texas. They say that, you know, it's impeding people's privacy and all these other things, even though if you go downtown, they have cameras on every street corner watching everything you do. But if you want to record the officer and the commission of the duty, they act like there's something weird or inappropriate about that. But long story short, uh, we saw the officer in my hometown of Tulsa, Oklahoma, the reserve officer who recently shot a man. He said he was reaching for his taser and pulled out his gun by mistake and, you know, killed a man in the middle of the street. And then they said the guy was refusing medical treatment. I don't think he was so much refusing medical treatment as he was freaked out that he had a bullet in him and they handcuffed him and he's probably freaking out and, you know, moving and all this kind of stuff. And they said, we couldn't render aid. Well, he's probably freaked out. They shot him, you know, a fleeing suspect. So these are the type of things that are going on. But after Ferguson, you know, there's really no good that came out of Ferguson. You know, uh, Mike Brown is dead. Darren Wilson will never again have a normal life. Uh, you have George Soros funding, you know, the rioters out there. So there's not a whole lot good that came out of it. But I can say that after that, these police departments, these sheriff's departments are on notice. They recognize they don't want another Ferguson to happen in their town. So when these officers do do something bad, especially if it's caught on camera, they are now much quicker to indict the officers, arrest the officers, uh, put them on trial. Because it used to be, you know, they'll spend three months of, taxpayer funds investigating themselves to find that their officers did nothing wrong. But now, thanks to people being quick with the cameras and uh, other forms of accountability, these things are starting to slowly change. And let's talk about something that's slowly changing. It's my view of all these people, these global warming critics, or I guess, oh, hold on, let me backpedal here, because we're going to talk about Bill Nye the Science Guy. Now, I love Bill Nye as a kid, but, you know, some of his recent comments in recent years talking about climate change he was on MSNBC, and he said, don't call it global warming, don't call it global cooling, call it climate change. He was speaking to the anchor on MSNBC. He says, because some days it's colder than others, so if you talk about global warming, people won't understand it. And if it's hotter than normal and you're talking about global cooling, people are going to laugh at you. This is, of course, a paraphrase of what he said. So it doesn't really make sense to me because you guys probably recall the article, 2014, the hottest year on record. It came out at the beginning of this year, and people were all too happy to point these things out to you. But something that was missing from that report, uh, 2014, the hottest year on record, with the exception of Chicago, Illinois, that was the coldest it was in 
100 years or Detroit, Michigan, which was also the coldest it was in over 100 years. So they type like to leave these things out of their reports, conveniently left out, and then they come out with, with all these justifications to uh, justify anything that they come up with. They want to talk about global warming. Meanwhile, you have the Great Lakes getting so cold they freeze onto the land masses, uh, get so cold that you have icebreaker ships that are pretty much giant ice picks of the sea getting stuck in ice, and they want to scream about global warming. Or they want to talk about global cooling, and of course we know there are hot spots around the globe, but there are also cold spots around the globe, which in my mind kind of balances things out. And speaking more on this, this uh, dynamic climate change, they say the climate is now worse now than it has ever been, which is to say, uh, just to uh, fill in the gaps of what they're saying here, when you can say something is, some, is definitively worse than it's ever been, that means they have gone to every continent and looked at every recorded natural disaster in human history and can now definitively say, after translating these things from every language, looking at every type of erosion and damage to trees and whatever else, they can definitively say they have boiled all this stuff down, put it into a digestible form, and can tell you the climate is now worse than it has ever been. Not to mention, you know, things like uh, the floods and the Bible or when fire rained down on Sodom and Gomorrah. But getting back to Bill Nye the Science Guy, you have Bill Nye and President Obama flying around on Air Force One giving you a lecture about how you need to live within your means and how you need to reduce your carbon footprint. And we have the text, or should I say the tweet from Bill Nye, heading down to DC to catch an Earth Day flight on Air Force One tomorrow with the president, we are going to act on the climate. So <laughs> these guys who are telling you to lessen your carbon footprint, whether it's Bill Nye the Science Guy or President Obama or Al Gore, Al Gore, who has a house on the sea and a $30,000 electricity bill between all of his mansions. You can go look that up. I, was, I believe that was 2013 that was reported. They're telling you that you need to live within your means. And now we even see President Obama saying that people in Africa cannot have air conditioning. Ultimately, if you think about all the youth that everybody's mentioned here in Africa, if everybody's raising living standards to the point where everybody's got a car and everybody's got air conditioning and everybody's got a big house, uh, well, the planet will boil over. And I had to slide that clip in there because I know there are people who wouldn't believe me if I just told it to them. So you have President Obama, and he's not the only one, Bush, Clinton, whoever else before him. They have taxpayer-funded Air Force One. They have these bulletproof gas-guzzling vehicles. They can afford to send their wives and children on separate vacation, take the Secret Service with them to go uh, do whatever with the prostitutes. They're burning up all this carbon, putting a very large carbon footprint on the planet. Meanwhile, they're telling you, if you live in hot Africa, you can't have air conditioning because that would impact the planet too much. So I'm just pointing out what they're doing. And now they want to pass the carbon tax, or they've been wanting to pass the carbon tax to tax you while these people are living, I guess, within their means, but way above what their carbon, uh, carbon rationing should be, according to their own statements. Now let's completely switch gears now and talk about ISIS. You know, we see ISIS when they're not receiving aid from U.S. and U.K. planes airdropping grenades to them. And then when they drop the grenades, I can't recall who it was. It's like somebody from the Defense Department. He said, like, one crate of grenades or one drop of grenades isn't going to stop the U.S. military, which is true. But it could hurt a lot of unarmed people who live in those villages and surrounding areas. So now you have ISIS who have AK-47s, they have grenades, and you have an unarmed population who have rocks and sticks it can do a whole lot of damage to them, but I guess that's just collateral, collateral damage. And now we have ISIS destroying the ancient Christian cemeteries in Iraq. The Islamic State released yet another set of images of militants desecrating Christian history, this time shattering ancient graves in Musal. And this was on April 16th, and we have the images there so you guys can see those on InfoWars.com. And this is what these guys are doing. They're killing Christians and many other groups as well. These guys are running wild, and uh, we seem content, just kind of sit back. And they say they want to, you know, go in places like Syria and try to root these guys out. And I'm not a fan of Assad, you know, I'm not cheerleading for the guy by any means, but we're funding our own opposition, whether it's Al-Qaeda, whether it's, uh, you know, when these guys change their name to ISIS and we drop them grenades and stuff, we're funding our own opposition. I cannot stress that enough. I know I talk about it every single week. But every single week they, you know, come up with a new thing. We have to go out there and fight ISIS. Well, why don't we stop funding them? You know, <laughs> like it, it'd be like a SWAT team giving guns to the Crips and the Bloods. Well, we have to go fight them. Well, like, why don't you stop giving them the guns and the drugs? And stop running guns into Mexico. 
but that's a different story. And since we're talking about guns and we're talking about the desecration of sites, let's talk about the desecration of our veterans. And now I know I will, from time to time, criticize things that are going on in the government, things that are happening with the military, but those comments and uh, suggestions and complaints are waged against the people way up top, the brass who are giving these guys these very uh, sometimes in eth unethical orders, these very uh, questionable things to go out there and do. You know, I'm not a big fan of them you know, doing a lot of domestic training, but really when it comes to things like Jade Helm, Jade Helm isn't the thing that really concerns me the most because yes, they are operating in various cities in Texas. I believe uh, Big Spring, Texas gave the military the, the go ahead to come through their town. It's not so much that because there is plenty of open Texas uh, desert that they can go and train in. Things that concern me is when they have to train domestically, they go and train in cities like Miami, Florida. What cave in Afghanistan looks like downtown Miami, Florida? What desert in Iraq looks like Minneapolis, Minnesota, also running drills in San Diego, California? Those are the things that concern me. Like, why you guys have to train in these big metropolitan cities like that? It doesn't look anything like the places that you're planning to go, at least that you tell us that you're planning to go. But that's a very long-winded way to say that even though I don't always support the orders that our troops are giving, I do support our troops, and I want them to have the best things for them when they come back home. For example, you know, you go out there and you fight for your country, then you come back home to a place like Fort Hood, and they're telling you you can't worship the gods you want. Or you come back here to the state of Texas, like if you're C.J. Grisham, and you're walking around, hey, I fought for my Second Amendment rights. They say, no, sir, you cannot own a gun. You cannot walk freely down the street with your firearm in the United States of America. And I think that is just plain wrong. We need to support our veterans when we come home. We just need to question some of these orders that they're given. And now in a Michigan town, it was controversial to put up a war memorial for our veterans, which was completely ridiculous to me because they say it's controversial to put up a statute of a gun in a boot because uh, somebody in the council thought it was inappropriate to show a gun. It's a symbol universally understood as one that honors fallen heroes. They used uh, a gun, a pair of boots, and a helmet, just like the memorial we are trying to set up. But some on the council have questioned whether the representation of a weapon is appropriate for the park. Any uncertainty about how the public feels was erased in less than two hours by the dozens who showed strong support here. And it's mind boggling to me that we will send our young men and women to fight overseas, but then when we have them come back home and they want to set up a memorial that depicts, lo and behold, a firearm, oh, that's just, that's too controversial. We can't have that here. Um, you know, our military veterans do go out there and use firearms. They do wear boots and dog tags and helmets and such. So I'm not sure why this would be viewed as controversial. But regardless, it was approved and luckily sanity prevailed. It reminds me of that, I can't recall where it was, but it was some city council. A gentleman walked in there. He was a veteran, honorably, honorably discharged. And he's up there talking and someone said, excuse me, sir, are you packing a pistol? He's like, yeah, I'm, you know, combat veteran, you know, served my country in the one of the councilmen says, oh, man, I, I can't stay in here. This guy has a gun. And everybody's like, well, you don't want to stay here. You can leave. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's this type of stuff. You know, we will celebrate these guys. We'll put them in the Super Bowl halftime shows and the USAA commercials and all that stuff. But just basic stuff like this, getting medical care, having a memorial, being able to uh, worship your God and own your firearms, that's just too much for some people in the United States of America. And while we're talking about our veterans and their firearms, VA sends veterans medical info to FBI to get their guns taken away. And this is basically a report obtained by the Daily Caller. And they point out a document dated February 22nd, 2012. And it makes clear that the VA must send health information to the FBI for its background check database. So it's the NICS system. So basically, if you go and purchase a firearm right now, you have to go through the NICS system if you go to a FFL dealer, you know, some places like... Uh, Cabela's or any other place that sells firearms. So now they're giving your personal information. If you're a veteran, if you have financial difficulties, or as the article says, veterans deemed mentally incompetent or financially incapable, they have to go through this system and potentially use their firearms. And I believe it was a senator or congressman, something like that. He said, our veterans should not lose their constitutional rights to bear arms because they can't balance their checkbooks. And I do agree. That does not make you a danger to society. You spent years fighting for your country overseas using your firearms. You should be able to have one when you come back home. But the degradation of our military does not end there. And now we have the article, 
U.S. Army forces cadets to wear high heels to promote feminist campaign. So basically, in this man's army, you are now forced to walk around in high heels like the Wicked Witch of the West. And this is somehow supposed to make you a better soldier and make you better capable to deal with females, I guess, in uh, your everyday life. Which does not make sense to me because uh, we do see accusations of false rape. I'm not saying they're rampant, but they do happen. But you don't force women to run around wearing jock straps to have male sensitivity week. Not at all. And when we talk about these guys walking around in their red heels, let's show people the image so they make sure we're not blowing smoke. Do you think when ISIS looks at that, they are shaking in their boots? They're probably laughing around about to urinate on themselves, uh, servicing these pictures back and forth. They probably have it on Twitter, probably printed it out and on the wall and you know, using it as a dartboard and all that stuff. This is what's going on. Our foreign aggressors, which ISIS, yeah, of course, we gave them the grenades, but they don't like us nonetheless. And now they have this stuff to laugh at us, and it's demoralizing. Who wants to walk around in some high heels? Hey, if you do that in your own personal time, that's, that's your business. But you should not be forced, and that's what these gentlemen are saying in this report. And we also had another gentleman who contacted Paul Joseph Watson and said he was forced to do a similar thing back in 2011. So this is going on, and like I said, I don't always agree with every decision our military makes, but we shouldn't force our veterans to be demoralized into wearing high heels. And while we're talking about this and this rape culture and rape sensitivity, Joe Biggs got a message today, and we're going to go out to break on this. We'll come back with more special reports from John Bowne and so forth. He got contacted by one of his friends in the military during a, I guess, a sensitivity training class, and you won't believe what he saw. Let's go to this video, and we'll be back right after this break. It was just yesterday we had a couple of articles about how kindergarten hey, David. and primary uh, people. Yeah, go ahead. Hey, uh, this is Joe Biggs. Uh, guess what? So my buddy is at a sexual harassment training course right now with the U.S. Army, and he took a picture of the slideshow, so we're going to put it up real quick. It says, tip number three, if you pull over to help someone whose car has broken down, remember not to rape them. <laughs> <laughs> this is real. You can't make this up. This is the actual slide <laughs> at the sexual harassment training the U.S. Army is doing. So not only do we have to walk around like a bunch of pansies in red high heels, but just in case we forgot that if we pull over to help someone, <laughs> Make sure don't rape them. Okay. I've got that on my list. Uh, <laughs> I've got that on my tip list. Unbelievable. Yeah. Essentially portraying everybody as a rapist is what they're implying there, talking down to them. But, you know, it was just yesterday that we had a couple of articles about how kindergarten teachers were sexualizing their kids, teaching them about homosexuality, teaching them about transsexuality, cross-dressing, and all that sort of thing. This is a brave new world agenda. It's not just 1984. We've got both of these things going on at the same time. And I don't think it's appropriate to talk, uh, to have a stranger talking to my kids about any kind of sex uh, in kindergarten. That's absolutely ridiculous. So it's not just the colleges. It's not just the military. That's where they have control over people is within the schools, within the colleges, within the military. They can say, you're out of here if you don't do what we say because we're going to end your career. We're not going to pass you in this test. That's the kind of leverage that they have over people. And, of course, uh, now that we have a volunteer professional army, that's a lot of leverage to have over people that they didn't have before when uh, uh, they were just pulling people up as they needed them for a war. My name is Alex Jones. Most of you know me from my syndicated radio program and my documentary films, as well as InfoWars Nightly News. When I got on air 20 years ago, I had discovered the globalist program, their plan to take over the world, and my focus went from running six miles every other day, swimming two, three miles a couple times a week, and lifting weights to focusing on fighting the globalist. I've gone from 279 pounds all the way down to 235 pounds and the weight's going off even faster. Super Male Vitality, Survival Shield X2 Nascent Iodine, and Oxy Powder. Those three products of the entire family of InfoWarsLife.com products are the most important from my own personal experience. And it wasn't just that my weight loss accelerated, my muscle mass increased, my stamina, my energy levels exploded. Now is the time to take action. Start your journey today with the Alex Challenge Pack. It's the trifecta of change. Secure yours today and get free shipping for a limited time at InfoWarsLife.com or 888-253-3139. 
the knowledge of the ancients, tried and true, trusted herbs and extracts fused with the latest nutraceutical science. Introducing the all-new Ancient Defense Herbal Immunity Blend, crafted with over 14 key ancient herbs and extracts to supercharge and prepare your body for what experts admit is the most dangerous season of the year. We have rejected hundreds of other formulations in our quest to bring you what is simply the most powerful and comprehensive proprietary formula that we have ever created in the realm of herbal immunity. For the last two years, our team has been working with top doctors, nutritionists, and chemists to develop the ultimate nutraceutical formulation. Experience the benefits of combining over 14 ancient herbs and extracts with exciting new advances in nutraceutical science. For a limited time, get 25% off on this introductory offer. Visit ancientdefense.com or call 888-253-3139. Ancientdefense.com. Back in May of 2012, while America slept, an amendment overturned the long-standing Smith-Munt Act of 1948 and the Foreign Relations Authorization Act of 1987 allowing for materials produced by the State Department and the Broadcasting Board of Governors to be released within U.S. borders. Michael Hastings of BuzzFeed.com put it this way, the new law would give sweeping powers to the State Department and Pentagon to push television, radio, newspaper, and social media onto the U.S. public. It removes the protection for Americans, says a Pentagon official who is concerned about the law. It removes oversight from the people who want to put out this information. There are no checks and balances. No one knows if the information is accurate, partially accurate, or entirely false. A WikiLeaks archive released recently reveals that the government is actively working with the corporate media to produce the sort of propaganda required to shape the foreign policy narrative of the United States. Within the trove lies ample evidence detailing a growing close relationship between the Obama administration, the State Department, and the transnational entertainment corporation, Sony. The archive demonstrates Sony Corporation's connections to the U.S. military-industrial complex. An email from Richard Stengel, U.S. State Department Undersecretary for Public Diplomacy and Public Affairs, reveals how the government enlisted Sony and other entertainment corporations in the propaganda war against ISIS and Russia. It is addressed to Sony's Michael Linton. It reads, It was great to see you yesterday. As you could see, we have plenty of challenges encountering ISIL narratives in the Middle East and Russian narratives in Central and Eastern Europe. In both cases, there are millions and millions of people in those regions who are getting a skewed version of reality, and it's not something that the State Department can do on its own, by any means. Following up on our conversation, I'd love to convene a group of media executives who can help us think about better ways to respond to both of these large challenges. This is a conversation about ideas, about content and production, about commercial possibilities. I promise you it will be interesting, fun, and rewarding. Michael Linton responded to this email by sending Stengel a list of names including Andy Bird, chairman of Walt Disney International, former Turner Broadcasting CEO Phil Kent, 21st Century Fox COO James Murdoch, and Drew Guff, a founding partner of private equity investment firm Sigler Guff. Another email from a staffer to Jane Hartley, the U.S. ambassador to France, shows how the government intends to exploit the celebrity of actors to push its foreign policy objectives. We have already started to think through ways your superstars could potentially help amplify some of the great work U.S. Embassy Paris is doing, the staffer wrote, reports Motherboard. We'd love to include Sony names and events here, either as guests or performers, and would love the opportunity to leverage their popularity to promote the president's priorities and agenda overseas. The director of press advance at the White House has joined the LA Times. The Los Angeles Times announced this morning the hiring of Johanna Mosca, an aide to President Obama. Mosca ironically employs the new age of newspeak by uttering, without a robust press pushing the boundaries of power, absolute power will corrupt absolutely. And that is precisely why we need organizations like the LA Times to survive. The tentacles of the Obama administration are quietly stretching into large sections of media. John Baum, Infowars.com.
symbols are powerful and the globalists have hijacked the symbols of America. They've turned them into their own symbols. Well, we are restoring the idea of the true republic, not the counterfeit globalist empire by promoting the icon George Washington and others. That's why we're rolling out on a 100% made in America line of incredible pro-liberty apparel. We are repopularizing liberty. We are helping fellow Americans rediscover what made this country great. We are the spirit of 1776. We are 1776 worldwide. We are all brothers and sisters in arms in the animating contest of liberty in the long march towards humanity's ultimate destiny of freedom. Visit madein1776.com today and vote with your dollars to promote truly made in America high quality products and promote the ideal of liberty. Another major health threat, this one in Toledo, Ohio, where everybody in the entire city has been told not to drink the water. Ohio's governor declaring a state of emergency. Did you know that the average person uses about 80 to 100 gallons of water at home every single day? If there's a water emergency, will you be prepared? Panicked residents forming long lines throughout the day. We're here at a supermarket in Toledo. You can see the shelves empty where water once was. To stay safe and healthy during a crisis, you must must have access to safe, clean water. Water which will not be available at your local grocery store. There's a mad dash on right now to stock up on supplies. The ProPure Pro 1 G2.0 water filtration system is a must have for every modern, independently minded household. Protect your family's safety during an emergency. Go to InfoWarsStore.com today to purchase your ProPure Pro 1 G2.0 water filtration system or call 1-88-253-3139. California's draconian vaccine Senate Bill 277 passed through the Education Committee today with a vote of 7 to 2. This means that California is just one step closer to mandatory vaccinations for any child who is attending public or private school, and parents will not have the option to exempt them from those vaccines claiming uh, religious or philosophical beliefs. So let's take a closer look at some of the games that were being played in order to make this vote possible. Now, last week, more than 700 parents showed up. They were very vocal in opposition to SB 277, and it was clear that the bill was going to fail right there. They did not have the votes necessary to support this legislation. Well, at that moment, uh, one committee chair who was in favor of this bill threw the Senator Richard Pan a bone. She gave him a total lifesaver. Check this out. If I were you, mm -hmm. I would not take a vote today. Rather than turn and listen to the several hundred parents who were there voicing their concern with this bill, Pan turned around to his handlers, which turns out to be lobbyists Jody Hicks and Janice Norman. He asked them for advice. Now, both of these lobbyists have ties to the California Medical Association, and the CMA has made no secret about their stance on vaccinations. They've recently launched the Community Immunity uh, which pushes for even more vaccinated adults. So right there when Pan turns to his lobbyist handlers and asks them for advice, it's clear who is really behind this bill. And it's more evidence of crony capitalism with a gun to your head. Obviously, the committee plans on passing this no matter what, uh, since you see right there that one of the committee chairs coaches Pan on how to request a vote only postponement, which means that there aren't going to be uh, a lot of parents showing up because there'll be no public testimony the second time around. Well, a lot of parents did show up, but they just weren't allowed to voice their opposition to this bill. But that's not all. A last minute switch was also made before today's vote, seeing Senator Huff who voted no on SB 277, replaced with another senator, and then Senator Bill Monning, who already voted yes on SB 277 previously, was added. And of course, the author of the bill was able to vote as well, and he voted yes. So it's very clear that people were working really hard behind the scenes to make sure that this was a yes vote. SB 277 was going to pass no matter what uh, against the wishes of many vocal parents. But, you know, we have to ask, are legislators really working for the greater good 
or are they working at the behest of for-profit corporations? You know, you know, you don't have to look any further than one of the bill's authors, state senator and pediatrician Dr. Richard Pan. Now, Pan was among more than two dozen California lawmakers who received campaign donations on record from Merck in the 2010 election cycle. And once again, his recent Senate campaign was backed by Merck, as well as GlaxoSmithKline and dozens of pharmaceutical companies and healthcare entities. Now let's talk about one of the faces of this vaccination campaign, Rhett Crott. He is the seven-year-old who is recovering from chemotherapy treatments for his leukemia, and he's been calling on legislators to protect kids like him from unvaccinated kids at school. So he's really being exploited to manipulate support for mandatory vaccinations. What you're not gonna hear in a lot of these heart-wrenching videos of Rhett is the fact that it's actually recommended for those going through cancer treatment to stay away from vaccinated individuals. And that can be found right in their own patient guides. You can look at John Hopkins' patient guide. It warns the immunocompromised to avoid contact with children who are recently vaccinated and to tell friends and family who are sick or who have recently had a live vaccine such as chickenpox, measles, rubella, intranasal influenza, polio, or smallpox, tell those people not to visit. And this is very similar to a statement that's also found on the website of St. Jude's Hospital. But those warnings, if you go and try and look at those links now, They've all been changed or the page is missing or expired. But through the power of the internet, all you have to do is use the Wayback Machine and it'll find a cached page there where you can see that prior to about March, when all of this vaccine campaigns really started to roll out and the big measles outbreak rolled out and they really started pushing for vaccination, if you go right before then, you'll see that right there, warning in the patient guide, avoid recently vaccinated individuals. Now, you will not see that after about March. So is the vaccine agenda really that big, really that strong, that they would put cancer patients at risk by removing those warnings from their guidelines? I mean, this is insane. The public health community is basically blaming the whole measles outbreak and everything on unvaccinated individuals, but it's more likely that they could have caught this from a recently vaccinated individual. And this takes me back to seven-year-old Rhett Crawett. His grandfather, Dr. Edward Crawett, MD, is a GlaxoSmithKline consultant. He's paid by GlaxoSmithKline. So yeah, no conflict of interest there, no exploitation of your seven-year-old there to push your vaccine agenda. Now, GlaxoSmithKline is making headlines once again after they're settling yet another major lawsuit. This brings their latest total to over $9.1 billion in payouts since 2003. Now, this time it is due to GlaxoSmithKline's product Pandemrix, which was the swine flu vaccine that was forced upon the public during the now admitted fake pandemic hoax of 2009. So now they're paying out people who were injured from those vaccines when the government c called this hoax, the swine flu pandemic that never was. Now, neurological damage from vaccines is, is not a rare occurrence. And in fact, the U.S. government itself has paid out $3 billion and counting to families of vaccine-injured children. So once again, we see them in total violation of the Constitution, violating people's freedom in order to uh, force medical tyranny on the population. And Big Pharma, once again, they enjoy legal and financial government protection status. They can continue damaging populations and they don't have to do any tests until those uh, neurological damage has already been done. They have very little oversight and they just use their deep pockets to pay off any legal and ethical challenges and senators along the way. Well, that's it for our show tonight. Be sure to go to prisonplanet.tv and get yourself a free trial. You can see the Alex Jones Show, the nightly news, the special reports, the rants, all right there on prisonplanet.tv. Well, I'm Jakari Jackson from the InfoWars Command Center, and we'll see you again tomorrow night.
used since before the days of the Roman Empire to support the body's natural systems and enhance overall health. Introducing the new InfoWarsLife.com Oil of Oregano Formulation, a highly advanced nutraceutical form of this key herb that has been traditionally used by civilizations for thousands of years to promote health. We have now procured the most high quality and potent forms of oregano oil on the market, sourced from top leading manufacturers to ensure a concentrated level of bioactive ingredients extracted directly from the wild herb and sealed in easy to use capsules. You will no longer need to endure the burning of liquid oregano on the tongue. Wild crafted from the Mediterranean oregano species that experts agree is one of the most powerful and most challenging to acquire. This winter season, it's more important than ever to secure this true form of oil of oregano. Now available in our limited first run at InfoWarsLife.com. That's InfoWarsLife.com or call 888-253-3139. You are watching the InfoWars Nightly News, which airs 7 p.m. Central at InfoWarsNews.com. And your support is helping us defend liberty worldwide.